going back to pharmacy in pakistan as our today's lecture topic is about the oncology supportive care and i'm feeling an immense pleasure to announce that for today's session we have our most respectable faculty member dr mansoor ahmed khan with us as uh, uh, dr mansoor ahmed khan is uh, much familiar in our pharmacy circle but for our young attendees i would like to give a brief introduction about dr mansoor ahmed khan is that he is currently working as a senior clinical pharmacist covering oncology hematology and bone marrow transplant at ministry of national guard health care effort affairs jeddah for the last 13 years he obtained his american bps certification in oncology in 2010 and recertification in 2017 he is a keen member of important committees in hospital including pharmacy and therapeutic committee and his formulary management recommendations have significant cost effective impact in ministry of national guard health affairs he is heavily involved in teaching students residents and fellows in the hospital as well as in the university he has also been involved in the research he established clinical pharmacy services in princess noura oncology center and other services in the department now i would like to officially welcome dr mansoor in our today's session assalam alaikum sir how are you wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh dr rita thank you so much uh, for the nice introduction and thank you so much for uh, hosting this organizing this to you and uh, dr rana and the whole team of the giving back to pharmacy in pakistan it's an honor for me to again uh, present uh, this topic and i was quite pleased to hear uh, the result of activity last year we had like a couple of people uh, got both certification uh, and bps from pakistan so uh, now i think i would like to share with you my screen can you see my screen now yes sir it's it's on the screen but uh, can you make it uh, the Is yeah, screen gonna... play option? Yeah, yeah. So it's a slide show now. Can you see this? Yes, sir. It's clear now. So as okay. everything goes smooth. Sure. So, uh... so, so should we start now? Yes, sir. You may start. Okay. Good. So uh, basically, this is going to be the same lecture that I presented last year. If it is available on YouTube uh, on the platform of the Giving Back to Pharmacy in Pakistan and YouTube channel of the Giving Back to Pharmacy in Pakistan, it's going to be uh, much uh, re repetitive sort of talk because you know, uh, uh, yeah, oncology hematology is one of the fastest growing discipline uh, for sure. The fifty percent of the drugs uh, in education getting approved uh, in the United States by US FDA is actually uh, falling within the domain of oncology hematology. Uh, but oncology supportive care is a pretty sort of basic thing, so there's not much uh, robust changes in oncology supportive care. So, so it's going to be pretty much similar kind of topic that I presented last year. I don't have any conflict, conflict of interest related to the contents of my presentation. These are my objectives. So, our um, objectives are very similar to the material that they need to prepare for taking the BCPS certification or recertification. So we will uh, identify, assess and recommend some of the appropriate um, pharmacotherapies for managing oncology supportive care, complications of cancer chemotherapy, uh, particularly nausea, vomiting, myelosuppression, growth factor support uh, use, uh, we'll try to address anemia and fatigue associated with anemia and cardiotoxicity, particularly when it comes to dextrazoxin. Uh, we'll also try to uh, uh, touch uh, upon um, appropriate pharmacotherapy for managing cancer-related pain or, can or cancer-related pain syndromes. And uh, lastly, we'll talk about some of the uh, uh, oncologic emergencies and pharmacotherapy for managing these oncologic emergencies, including febrile neutropenia and tumor syndrome. And most of the time, the students uh, seeking BPS certification, they're actually tested for these kind of uh, topics that we're going to cover today. So these are my resources for the CINV, which is the first uh, segment of uh, the oncology supportive care. And uh, I begin with this audience response question. Uh, I uh, will read it for you. A 55-year-old woman, FY, was recently given a diagnosis of relapsed Hodgkin disease. Uh, 
She will begin treatment with cisplatinum, 100 mg per meter square on day one, plus gemcitabine, 1000 mg per meter square on day one, plus eight, and dexamethasone, 40 mg daily for four days, every three weeks, which is uh, the most appropriate antimatter regimen for preventing acute uh, nausea vomiting in this patient. So we have four options. A preprint plus olanzapine plus dexamethasone, or a preprint plus glenicitron plus dexamethasone, or C is a preprint plus glenicitron plus lenocitron, or B is lorazepam plus uh, rolipidin plus nitrotropamide. So we'll go through the subject of gene therapy induced nausea vomiting and we'll come back to this question. Well, I have seen in my uh, career, in my professional career, uh, I started in 1999, 2000. So we had seen people uh, developing a severe complication from chemotherapy. And before us, like before the era of the 5-HT3 receptor antagonist and NK1 receptor antagonist, uh, people have been throwing their gut out. So the nausea vomiting was one of the most distress full side effect. In many people, they have been actually diffusing chemotherapy, even for potentially curable diseases such as lymphoma, leukemia. So uh, after the advent of the novel agents, such as 5 ht 3 receptor antagonist and NK1 receptor antagonist, uh, there have been significant control of the nausea vomiting. However, yet uh, the uh, some of the uh, uh, things that I would like to mention here that uh, the some of the um, aspects of the chemotherapy induced nausea vomiting, which were not very well covered until now, was particularly delayed nausea. So even three drug combination was not enough uh, for the management or prevention of the chemotherapy induced delayed nausea, delayed uh, vomiting. And also the scenarios which were addressed in clinical trial or in the guidelines, they talk about like single day uh, scenario. For example, um, the scenario that I described before, the cisplatinum is given on, on day one only. So you can easily give like um, uh, chemotherapy for acute chemotherapy and just nausea vomiting on day one, and then epipotent, for example, on day two and day three. But most of the time, the scenarios which are multiple daily uh, chemotherapy uh, protocols, for example, five days protocols, such as ESHAP or um, uh, DHAP or hypersevad or BMP protocols, which are uh, more than BEP protocol, for example, which are more than five days or seven days protocols. So these are not addressed by the guidelines. So we'll, we'll try to address those. So before that, we need to understand the pathophysiology of the chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. So there are two main mechanisms of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting with regards to the pathophysiology. There is a central uh, mechanism and there is a, a peripheral mechanism. So basically the peripheral mechanism, which is most commonly uh, uh, responsible for acute chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, which is defined as nausea vomiting happening within the 24 hours of receiving chemotherapy, that basically is, uh, is peripheral. So what happens when you give chemotherapy, chemotherapy can produce the free radicals, and these free radicals can actually stimulate the enterochromaffin cells of the eye tract, uh, which can release the serotonin. So these serotonin uh, will bind with their uh, respective receptors, 5 h receptors, and will stimulate the vagus nerve. And that will go all the way to the chemotherapy uh, receptor trigger zone, or NTS, which is nucleus uh, tract solitarius, and can induce the nausea vomit. So that's why 5 h receptor antagonists are very effective for controlling chemother uh, acute chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, and they're not effective for delayed chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting because 5 ht 3 receptor-mediated uh, mechanism is mainly peripheral. Although there is some involvement in the central uh, mechanism as well, but the most prominent or most profound uh, involvement is in the peripheral uh, nervous system. Then we have the central mechanism, which is uh, uh, mainly mediated by NK1 uh, receptor antagonists, which can directly stimulate um, uh, or activate the, the NTS uh, or CTZ and can result in nausea vomiting, or they can also work peripherally. So that's why uh, the NK1 receptor antagonists, such as epipotent, erlipotent, natripotent, are effective not only in acute chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, they're also effective in controlling and preventing delayed chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. So here's the definition that I've been talking about. The nausea is uh, uh, an inclination to vomit, a feeling in the throat or every gastric region, al alerting an individual that vomiting is uh, uh, imminent. Uh, and vomiting is actually the act of uh, ejection or expulsion of the gastric contents through the mouth. 
And here we have the definition of different types of nausea and vomiting. So acute nausea and vomiting happens within the 24 hours after receiving chemotherapy delayed. Nausea and vomiting happens uh, 24 hours after receiving chemotherapy. And anticipatory nausea and vomiting, it refers to um, uh, you know, recalling the previous experiences of the previous chemotherapy cycles where the patient had like terrible experience with the nausea vomiting. And the next time that when the patient is coming to receive the second cycle of chemotherapy, so even before the start of chemotherapy, smelling the same kind of, uh, uh, you know, smells or, or seeing same kind of objects or hearing the same kind of, uh, you know, voices or maybe even seeing same kind of nurse will elicit uh, the start of nausea or anything. So for that reason, we, we try to give like lorazepam. Uh, to control the anti sebatory uh, uh, nausea vomiting like a day before, the night before the chemotherapy. The breakthrough uh, nausea vomiting happens uh, in, uh, typically on the day of chemotherapy administration, despite the fact we are giving uh, prophylactic uh, antiemetics. And the refractory nausea vomiting is uh, defined as the nausea vomiting, which happens despite the fact we are giving all kinds of uh, prophylactic and rescue therapy and still happens. So that's called refractory nausea vomiting. These are the risk factors. So you can be tested in the exam, like one of the risk factors. So a patient age more than less than 40 is a risk factor, female gender, history of motion sickness, history of uh, nausea vomiting during previous uh, pregnancies, are uh, patients having poor control of nausea vomiting in uh, previous cycles of chemotherapy as I talked about earlier, uh, depression, anxiety, and the patient did not sleep the night before, that can also be a risk factor. And um, Children uh, have uh, more nausea vomiting than adults. And the history of uh, chronic alcoholism is, on the other hand, protective. It reduces the incidence of uh, nausea vomiting, but that does, does not encourage the patient to uh, drink alcohol. So let's classify the antineoplastic agents according to the NCCM guidelines, um, our ESCO guidelines. So chemotherapy, which can cause nausea vomiting in 90% or more than 90% of patients without the provision of uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting prophylaxis is called highly mutagenic. For example, cisplatinum any dose, which is mentioned in our uh, first audience response question, it's highly mutagenic. Moderate, uh, chemo uh, moderately mutagenic chemotherapy is the one which can cause nausea vomiting in 30 to 90 percent of patients if we don't give the antimatic prophylaxis. And low is defined as uh, the one which can cause 10 to 30 percent of patients, and the minimal is uh, the noun to cause nausea vomiting in less than 10 percent of patients. So uh, when we are giving antimatic, we have to consider some of the factors uh, like, for example, the metagenicity of chemotherapy and the uh, potency and the mechanism of the antimatic regimens that we're going to use. So here is the NCCN guidelines, uh, which uh, categorizes patient into uh, high hematic risk, moderate, minimal, and low hematic risk. So for example, you can see here, highly hematogenic cisplatinum is there. AC combination, adramycin cyclophosphamide combination, and then carplatinum A AUC equal to more than four, and many other because of paucity of time, it cannot go over all, but I explained the definition. So that is uh, uh, the different uh, classes, different medications, different antineoplastic agents are classified in NCCN in different categories according to the definition that I discussed in the previous slides. This is low and minimal hematic risk. So, and this is for oral anti-cancer agents. They are um, categorized basically into two classes, moderate to high and minimal to low. So here we have the three different regimens for chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting. And basically, you can be tested in BCPS exam uh, for this regimen. So you have to keep this slide in your mind. Uh, this is most commonly asked question, like they can test you and ask you like, what is the most commonly used regimen for prevention of chemotherapy induced nausea vomiting. So NCCN preferred regimen is uh, treatment option A, which is basically four drug combination. So we have here olanzapine, which uh, was not there before, like three, four years ago, olanzapine was not part of the standard antiemetic reflexes. So what we used to have an NK1 receptor antagonist, you can choose any one of them, like a preptin. Uh, oral are, are injectable or forced uh, equipotent, uh, natupitin or injectable form of the natupitin, which is forced natupitin, or rolapitin, which is only oral. Uh, uh, and this is, you can choose only one of them. And then 5-HT3 antagonists, you can choose one of them. And uh, the dexamethasone is the 12 milligrams. So this is four drug combination. So I'll talk about the study, which was the basis of this recommendation by NCCN and also American Society of Ecology guideline for this recommendation, which is preferred regimen for highly hematogenic chemotherapy. 
one point that you have to keep it in mind that abripotent are nitripotent, and uh, these are C3A4 inhibitors. So dexamethasone is a substrate of that enzyme. So whenever you use abripotent, you have to use the dexamethasone dose to formulate them. Just to tell you historically, the dose of the dexamethasone used for highly abutenic chemotherapeutic agent has to, uh, was 20 milligram. But whenever we using uh, a prepotent, we reduce the dose to 12 milligram. So now the 20 milligram dose is not mentioned in the guidelines because all the time we're using a prepotent or nitropotent or a lipotent for these kind of vaccines. Other options are options B, which is non uh, prepotent or NK1 containing regimen. And the option C is similar to option A, but without polyzapine. Uh, this uh, previous slide was for acute chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, and this slide is about uh, delayed chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. So, in uh, in this uh, um, uh, slide, uh, basically, sorry, my apologies. The previous slide was for highly emetogenic chemotherapy agents, uh, and the first column is uh, for acute chemotherapy induced nausea vomiting, and the second column is for delayed chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. So if you have used a prepotent 125 milligram on day one, then you have to use 80 milligram on day two and day three. And olenzapine, uh, typically five milligram has to be continued on day two, day three, and day four. You don't have to give uh, N, uh, five HD3 receptor antagonists, such as ganicetron or colonocetron or dolacetron, because they're not effective for delayed chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. And dexamethasone dose has to be continued eight milligram for the next three days. And uh, option C is very similar to option A, but you know, we don't have the olenzapine. So the second slide is about actually moderately emetogenic chemotherapy aging. It is very similar to the previous slide with the uh, slight difference is that uh, you don't have to, you don't necessarily have to give NK1 receptor antagonist for moderately emetogenic chemotherapy aging. But if the patient had like previous experiences of poor nausea monitoring control, in that case, uh, you can add uh, uh, a prepotent in this uh, uh, for this patient, but it is like, customized sort of uh, approach. You don't have to give it to all patients. You have to give it to those patients who had like previous uh, poor control of nausea vomiting in previous cycles. Now coming back to the first audience response question, uh, which was, uh, which is here in front of you right now. So based on that, uh, so either three drug combination or four drug combination is appropriate based on NCCN guideline. Remember that in, you know whenever you are taking the BCOP exam, BCOP exam, you are always tested based on NCCN guidelines and likewise in BCPS as well. So the preferred regimen is four drug combination, but we don't have a four drug combination option here. But we had seen in NCCN guideline there was a three drug combination option, and there was. Uh, NK1 receptor antagonist, and there was 5-HT3 receptor antagonist, and there is dexamethasone. So NK1 receptor antagonist is a prepotent, and 5-HT3 receptor antagonist is ganicitron and steroid, which is dexamethasone, so the right option is B. Now, the second audience response question, which is the most appropriate regimen for anticipatory nausea and vomiting? So anticipatory nausea vomiting, that means the patient is recalling from the previous experiences. So what we have to do, we have to produce a sort of amnesia. How can we do that by addition of lorazepam? So option C, I can see here, nitropitin, um, uh, alonocitron, dexamethasone, and lorazepam. That is correct option for audience response question number two. I think it's gonna come towards the end. So for anticipating nausea vomiting, you have to use benzodiazepine, which can cause a sort of um, amnesia and the patient forgets the previous experiences. It has uh, no antihematic uh, activity if you are minimal antihematic activity when you use it as a single agent, but it has very good antihematic activity when it is used adjuvant in combination with other uh, antihematics. So what it does basically it causes amnesia. So the patient forgets the previous uh, uh, bad experiences and also it relieves some kind of anxiety. And we have al already stated that anxiety is one of the risk factors for the nausea and vomiting. And sometimes when we use methoclopramide, which we don't use a lot right now, but in the past we people have been using like 40 milligram Q6 hours. So which can cause some sort of like uh, extra pyramidal symptoms um, called EPS. So lorazepam actually helps in controlling these kind of EPS as well. Now, coming back to this question, so um, I think I already answered it. So correct option is C. So 
lorazepam has to be added in order to have retrograde amnesia in order to forget the previous experiences. <laughs> so this is uh, a summary of the ESCO, NCCN, and MASC ESMO guidelines for international um, uh, bodies uh, in oncology guidelines. Um, so th there's a summary of it. So for highly methogenic chemotherapy agent for acute chemotherapy induced cardiac vomiting, ASCO recommends four drug combination. NCCN recommends four drug combination or three drug combination. MASC and ESMO, they recommend four drug or three drug combination. And for moderate, it's only two drug combination, 5-HT3 receptor antagonist and dexamethasone, no need for a preparation. So is NCCN as well as MASC. For delayed chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, uh, ASCO, NCCN, and MAPS, they're pretty similar. So, two drug combinations. So, you don't give um, 5 H to 2 receptor antagonist on, um, on uh, day two and day three. But there are some agents, uh, NK1 receptor antagonists, for example, Rolapitan, it has long half life. It's effective for 14 days. Netupitan, uh, Akinzio, is effective for seven days. So, you don't have to give it on day two and day three because it is. Uh, principally pharmacokinetically working for seven days or 14 days uh, uh, if you're talking about long acting and K1 receptor antagonist. But if it is a preparant, then you have to give it on day two and day three as well. But moderate, you don't have to give anything uh, except the dexamethasone on day two and day three and day four, same is the NCCN and the mass guidelines. So actually, what many centers are doing, actually, when I've seen in uh, my hospital here as well as in Shogatana Cancer Hospital, people have been using. 5-HT2 receptor antagonist um, for many days after the chemotherapy. That is a completely wrong concept, actually, you know, because 5-HT2 receptor antagonists we discussed in the pathophysiology are not effective pathway in controlling the delayed, delayed chemo chemotherapy and use nazi and vomiting. I would like to take you to this study, which was uh, the landmark study for the addition of olanzapine in uh, NCCN guideline as a preferred regimen, as well as an ESCO guideline, MASC and ESMO guideline as a preferred regimen uh, for drug combination. So you can see uh, quickly, I will take you, uh, take you through. So the uh, olanzapine arm, they receive four drug combination and placebo arm, they receive three drug combination. It's not only placebo, it's actually 5 h 2 receptor antagonist and it is NK1 receptor antagonist and steroid plus placebo and the olanzapine arm received by four drug combination. There was uh, no nausea at 24 hours uh, in 74% of patients versus 45% patients in placebo. So the men looked at the nausea and uh, uh, delayed nausea, which is uh, from 24 hours to uh, in one day to five days, it was 42% despite the fact we were giving four drug combination around uh, um, 50 Three, 57% uh, of patients that were still having actually nausea, whereas in uh, three drug combination, 75% of patients that were having the nausea. So uh, based on this, st this study, actually, the olanzapine was added to four drug combination, preferred regimen and NCCM guideline and ASCO guidelines. And then this study, uh, which uh, was the randomized phase three control trial, they basically compared a um, uh, natriopidin and colonocitron combination, fixed dose combination, versus ganicitron and, uh, uh, and uh, a preparant plus steroid. So it is very uh, sort of um, uh, similar to our formulary, uh, you know, um, options here in the Ministry of National Guard Health Affairs. So I'll show you why. Because here you can see it's a non-inferiority based study. So NEPA is a natriopitan and clonocitron fixed dose combination and the apiptan and was compared with the NEPA and of course with the background of the dexamethasone. And you can see in acute as well as in delayed chemotherapy induced nausea, I think there was no differences. So NEPA, which is an akin zero or natriopitan and, and, and uh, clonocitron fixed dose combination plus dexamethasone was non-inferior to apiptan and granicitron plus dexamethasone combination. Why I was telling you that it is more applicable to our institution at Ministry of National Government Affairs because we were having a preparant and granicitron and dexamethasone as our formulary options for highly amethogenic chemotherapy agents as antimatics. However, when we found that natriopitan and clonocitron is uh, uh, equally uh, equally effective to a preparant and granicitron, and it is cheaper than a preparant and granicitron combination. And another advantage of the natriopitan uh, over the preparant is that natriopitan is effective for seven days. So multiple days regimens, such as five days regimens, uh, BMT regimens, bromelar transplant regimens, they can be treated very well with natriopitan because it's uh, effective for seven days. So for that reason, we added natriopitan, clonocitron, replacing a preparant and granicitron combination um, 
for cost-effective um, uh, option for highly hematogenic chemotherapeutic agents. Moving to the second segment of our presentation, which is cancer pain syndromes. So this is the first audience response question. Uh, so the 75 year old man has a metastatic prostate cancer. The main site of the metastatic diseases are regional lymph nodes and bones. He has itching pain with occasional shooting pain. The latter are thought to be the result of nerve compression by large and large lymph nodes. He has been taking oxycodone of estaminophen five milligram to tablets every four hours and ibuprofen 400 milligram every eight hours. His current pain rate is uh, eight out of 10, which is severe pain, and he states that his pain cannot be controlled. Which one of the following choices is the best to manage his pain at this time? So we'll come back to that. So uh, what is our goal for the cancer pain uh, management? So around 75% of patients with advanced disease and about one, quarter, one third of patients with newly diagnosed patients, they present with severe pain. And our um, uh, goal of the pain management is actually pain-free at work, pain-free at sleep, pain-free at, uh, you know, all the time. And one of the things that we have found out that actually we have to treat the cause of the pain, not the pain itself. I mean, in order to treat the cause, you have to understand the syndrome. So we call it pain associated, cancer associated pain syndrome. So for example, if the, if the pain is due to the inflammation, so we have to give anti-inflammatory drugs, which is NSAID or corticosteroids. If the patient is having um, uh, bone pain, so we have to give NSAIDs. So for example, if the pain is having bone metastasis, so we have to give bone modifying agencies, genosumab, zoledronic acid. So that's how I'm treating my, my cancer patients. For example, a patient having severe pain, and I look at this canes, and patient has lytically and multiple myeloma patient, a breast cancer patient, a prostate cancer patient, a lung cancer patient with a bone metastasis. You keep on increasing morphine doses, it's not gonna work unless you treat a cause. So that's why we call it pain-specific syndromes. So if you give them the zoledronic acid or denosumab, they're gonna work better than increasing the doses of morphine. So um, if, if the, there's a disease um, uh, that's, that needs some kind of uh, you know, control, so disease control. So for example, if uh, there's a pancreatic cancer tumor causing pain, shooting pain, so you have to give chemotherapy or steroids or radiation therapy. Um, if the patient has, uh, uh, for example, the bone is fractured, and you're giving morphine, it's not gonna work until, until you ask the orthopedic uh, surgeon to fix it, that you, you, uh, you, know, you do the surgery and fix it, and then uh, this pain will be controlled. So, so idea of cancer pain management is uh, to understand the cancer pain syndrome, and you have to treat each syndrome or each cause. So for some time, like the best anti-cancer medication is chemotherapy, sometimes it is surgery, sometimes it could be radiotherapy, sometimes this could be bone modifying agents, and sometimes it could be NSAIDs and corticosteroids, sometimes it could be psychosocial therapy as well. Some, sometimes people have like total pain. So they have like depression, they have like psychosocial issues. So if you address them, so yes, it's called total pain. So you have to understand the cancer pain symptoms. So cancer pain is quite complex phenomena. It's not only just dosing the morphine and, and addressing the side effects of the morphine. No, 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 no. You have to understand the cancer pain syndrome completely in order to completely treat these kind of patients. So for the severity of the pain uh, scales, we, we evaluate them on a scale of zero to 10. Zero means no pain and 10 means uh, very severe, unimaginable pain. And actually, the patient doesn't have to describe it. You can see it yourself. The patient is literally crying, sometimes cannot speak, heart rate is very high. And the, the people who cannot communicate, for example, children, so you can see them crying. And actually, you know, these patients have a different threshold. So some people, they may, they may be crying um, at a pain uh, rating scale of five, or another person who might be controlling his pain and emotions and, and sentiments, even at the level of 10 for the other patients. So it's highly, uh, you know, subjective phenomena and, uh, and different for the different. So you have to have an individualized approach for each and every patient. So there is no fixed dose for each patient. Each patient has an individualized different dosing requirement of the pain uh, uh, medications. So for persistent pain, severe pain, uh, we try to use longer duration in, in order to cover like longer duration uh, of the pain management. So for example, we have Martin Sulfate tablet, which can be used long acting, can be used like Q12 hours. We have hydromorphone, which can be used like Q12 hours or once daily, and uh, stuff like that. This patient is already getting 60 milligrams of oxycodone 
and uh, almost four grams of acetaminophen per day. So um, option C is not correct. And uh, if we increase uh, the dose of the oxycodone and, and the acetaminophen, it will increase the daily dose. So option A and B are not correct as well. So option D is the correct, which means to discontinue oxycodone and acetaminophen and add morphine sulfate every 12 hours. So that's the correct option. So you can have my slides and go through them because of positive time I need to go over quickly. So fourth audience response question, which is the most appropriate adjuvant adjunctive medication for this patient's pain? It's naproxen, single agent, acetaminophen, gabapentin, and baclofen. I think this patient has a component of uh, neuropathic pain. So neuropathic pain is due to the compression and inflammation, uh, compression of the nerve particularly. So for those uh, patients, we consider neuropathic so for those kind of patients, we consider neuropathic uh, uh, medication to treat neuropathic pain, for example, antidepressant, anticonvulsant. Uh, we can typically give them pregabalin, gabapentin, amitriptyline, et cetera. So these are mentioned here. So in this patient, the perfect uh, and correct option is the gabapentin because uh, we don't need muscle relaxant here, so we don't need baclofen. Option A is not correct because the patient is already receiving and such. Acetaminophen will not provide additional benefit. Answer B is uh, not correct. So what we need is uh, something to treat peripheral neuropathy, which is only gabapentin. Switching so gear to the segment number three, which is uh, the use of colony stimulating factors in neutropenia and febrile neutropenia. So these are the resources. So audience response question number five. A 50-year-old woman is receiving adjuvant chemotherapy for stage two breast cancer. She received her third cycle of doxorubicin and cyclophosphamide 10 days ago. Her CBC today includes WBC 600, segmented neutrophils 60%, band neutrophils 10%, et cetera. So what is the correct options? So you have to calculate ANC, uh, you know, absolute neutrophil counts. So sometimes you are tested in BCPS, uh, not BCOP. It is sort of very simple thing for the BCOP, but maybe in BCPS you can be tested for this kind of question. So this is the equation, the absolute neutrophil count or ANC is equal to WBC uh, times percentage of the neutrophil plus percentage of the bands. Um, so what you do basically in this patient, uh, the normal range is about 4,000 to 11,000 uh, of WBC. And uh, you can report them as four uh, into 10 days to the power three into 11 into 10 days to the power three as well. Um, so basically here, what you can see, the WBC, uh, so the, uh, so the neutrophil was 60% and the vein was 10%. So what you do is basically 60 uh, uh, divided by 100 and 10 divided by 100 is 0. 0.6, 0. 0.1. So it's 70%. So total 60% is the neutrophils and 10% is the vein. So totally 70%. So 70% of the 600 is about 420. So the correct option is uh, uh, 420. So given this ANC, our absolute neutrophil account, audience response question number six, which statement is the most appropriate? This patient should be initiated on a GCSF, or the patient should begin prophylactic treatment with either a quinolone antibiotic or Bactrim, or this patient with neutrophilic should be monitored closely for signs and symptoms of infection, decrease the doses of um, adriamycin cyclophosphamide in the next cycle of treatment. So what do you think? So, so we have different options as a CSF in my hospital. I think in many hospitals uh, around the world, they have Phil Graston and the long acting one, which is back Phil Graston. And now these days we also have uh, uh, biosimilar Phil Graston like Zerzi or Nivestim or any others. So for the cost effective reasons, so we did evaluation and, and you know we convinced the administrators uh, to replace uh, uh, Neopagen filgrastim as well as pac filgrastim with the Zerzio, which is more cost effective. The, the pac filgrastim is long acting, six, six milligram uh, single dose, and is effective for 14 days theoretically, although I have some reservation about it. And then we have the GC, GMCS, which we don't have, Sargram Mostim or Mogram Mostim, but it was available some times ago. So, as per NCCM guidelines and IDSA guidelines uh, and uh, US FDA recommendation, so this is an important statement here. Uh, you can be tested in BCPS exam for that. So any chemotherapeutic agent which can cause uh, which can cause uh, febrile neutropenia in 20% or more than 20% of patients 
it is recommended to give these patients primary prophylaxis with filbrastib in order to minimize the consequences, uh, minimize the uh, incidence of neutropenia, grade 3 to 4 neutropenia, which is less than 500 neutrophil cells, and the complications associated with the severe neutropenia, grade 4 neutropenia. There are some dose dense regimens, which are, for example, adriamycin cyclophosphamide, where, which is used for breast cancer every 14 days. Uh, it is recommended to use filgrastim in order to maintain the dose density and dose intensity of chemotherapeutic agents. Remember, maintaining the dose density and dose intensity is very crucial in order to achieve the clinical outcomes. So maintaining the dose density means you're continuing at the similar frequency, and the dose intensity means that you're maintaining 100% of the dose, and that's possible with the CSFUs in these kind of regimens. So here's the NCCN guidelines uh, that tells you that the patient doesn't have uh, associated with fibrantropenia regimens, uh, not the patient regimens, which are associated with fibrantropenia in more than or equal to 20% of um, uh, cases. You have to use canistron uh, colony stimulating factors, with category one recommended option. Remember, you're gonna be tested for the examination question, which are category one recommended treatment options. And some patients with intermediate risk, 10 to 20%, for example, age more than 65, geriatrics, you may consider um, GCSF in these kind of patients as well, but less than 20 percent has no recommendation to use filgrastim as primary prophylaxis. So here in this uh, slide, you have the different uh, options uh, of different regimens, uh, which can cause uh, fibrantopenia in more than 20 percent of patients, and they are candidate for the primary prophylaxis with filgrastim. So among this, you can see here the breast cancer, the regimen that we are using to get in this patient. Audience response question, which is dose dense AC, uh, idriomycin and cyclophosphamide. It is listed here. Dose dense means every 14 days. The same cycle when you use every three weeks, you're not going to be using filgrastim for this kind of patient. And uh, the use of filgrastim and fibrantropenia management is not recommended. Actually, you know, the, uh, our case in audience response question is not fibrantropenia, is not spiking fever. Uh, and his neutrophil counts are less than 500. So he is definitely having grade five, grade four neutropenia, but he's not having fever. So it is out of the context for that patient, but you know, generally if the patient spikes fever, you know, uh, it's not recommended to use filgrastin for the fibrantropenia. The reason was the study which was published more than two decades ago, which had shown that use of filgrastin did not improve the survival. So there was no survival benefit. However, there was a reduction in grade four neutropenia duration by one day, antibiotic therapy by one to two days, hospital stay by two days. I, uh, because we're using biosimilar filgrastin, so when I use this in equating and, and populating the cost-effective benefits, so I found like use of filgrastin is cost-effective if you use it for the management of infoplantopenia, but for the purpose of uh, the test uh, in the exam uh, purposes, uh, you have to remember that there is no role of filgrastim in fibrantropenia management. If you say yes, uh, your option will be wrong, but in practice, I do it. So uh, I think we talked about that. Uh, you have to consider the neutropenic nadir. Uh, which is typically, um, it happens, uh, fibrantropenia, drop in the neutrophil count happens by day seven, you know, three to four or five half-lives of the neutrophil. One half-life of the neutrophil is about one to three days. So we're talking about four half-lives, typically seven to 10 days. So neutrophil count start dropping. And then the later of the fibrantropenia is about 10 to 14 days, unless it is AML consolidation, which would be even longer. So this patient is uh, presenting on day 10. So this is typically the time where the patient can have neutropenia, wait for neutropenia, or neutropenia. Okay, so when do we consider use of the filgrastim? So we have to uh, classify the patients whether our intent is curative or non curative. So if our intent is curative, so we have to consider primary versus secondary prophylaxis. In this patient, there is no need to give filgrastim right now, but when you give the next cycle, you have to consider giving secondary prophylaxis. If your, if your intent is curative and non curative, so what you can do, you can reduce the dose of the chemotherapy. But this is early stage breast cancer in our audience response question, this scenario. You cannot reduce the dose of the adriamycin and cyclophosphamide in that patient because your intent is curative. So in curative intent, you don't reduce the dose of chemotherapy because you won't achieve cure. So you're aggressive, patient is going to go through tough uh, journey of uh, complication, but at the end, uh, there will be benefit of 
cure. So all what you're trying to do is throw all your resources in order to achieve the cure. But for non-curative, we just gonna use cures. For example, advanced breast cancer, metastatic prostate cancer, which you're gonna do no need for, for grasping. If you give it, it's not wrong, but what you need to do, reduce the dose of chemotherapy because your, your purpose is not curative, your purpose is just the palliative. So given this ANC, which statement is appropriate? So here's the options. The patient who is neutropenic should be monitored closely for signs and symptoms of infection because he's not febrile neutropenic, no need to start antibiotic. We don't give antimicrobial prophylaxis uh, if the profound neutropenia, uh, neutropenia is less than seven days. This patient should not be started on full gastrum right now, but we can consider it in future. And Decreasing the dose of AC over the next cycle is not an option because this is curative patient. Okay, now switching gear to fibrantropenia. So fibrantropenia is a common complication of cancer. It's a medical emergency. And uh, if you don't treat it, address it uh, immediately, then you can lose the patient. So it's a medical emergency. So here we have the definition of fibrantropenia. So we have four options and you have to see like which option is the correct option. Uh, so what happens when chemotherapy is given, uh, it kills the cancer cells and it kills the most rapidly proliferating cell lines, for, for example, bone marrow and mucosal cell membrane. So it can cause uh, neutropenia, uh, especially when you have a grade four neutropenia and the uh, patient has fever, so that's called fibrotropenia. And then the sources of infection, it could be the GI mucosa, which is broken down with chemotherapy. So the normal flora of the GI because I can actually uh, penetrate uh, into the bloodstream causing the infection. So for that reason, if the patient has grade 3 to 4 mucositis, so that's an indication to give them a vancomycin here because peptococcus, peptostreptococcus can penetrate into the bloodstream. And if you have the, and, uh, you know, the GI mucos, the uh, uh, entire GI intestinal mucositis, so the risk is not only gram positive, but also gram negative. So you have to give uh, empirical antibiotics. I mean, you have to always give empirical antibiotics, which is uh, which uh, uh, covers pseudomonas, plus minus, uh, and gram negative and gram positive, other gram negative and gram positive as well. So it's in a, a medical emergency, which has to be addressed and treated immediately. And around 10 to 20% of the patients, they present with the bacteremia episodes. Uh, but, you know, we cannot wait until the culture is out, or we cannot wait until the CBC is out. So what we have to do, we have to see the clinical context of the patient. So if the patient present with uh, fever and neutrophil less than 500, or neutrophil even more than 500, but expected to drop below 500 in the next 48 hours, we start with um, empirical antibiotics. But before giving empirical antibiotics, what we do, we do like, uh, uh, we do like chest x-rays, oh, sorry, blood culture, two sets of blood culture, sputum culture, blood culture, and other septic screen. And here's the definition of the fibrinotropenia, fever more than equal to 38.3 on more than 38 over one hour, and uh, neutrophil count less than 500, or uh, less than 500, but expected to be dropped to less than 500 over, over the next 48 hours is called fibrinotropenia. So this is the definition, uh, neutrophil counts less than 500, and uh, the temperature more than 38.32 centigrade is the correct definition here. So <clears throat> the physician has to, you know, uh, the clinical pharmacist has important role in uh, uh, fibrantropenia management. In my hospital, it was me and my team who wrote the guideline for the fibrantropenia management, on how to try it to these patients and stuff like that. Although being a clinical pharmacy, you don't have to diagnose, but you can educate physicians who are evaluating the patients, so they have to do evaluation very quickly. So you have to do like size specific history, for example, anybody having chest symptoms, you have to do the chest x-rays, uh, urinary tract uh, symptoms, so you have to do your urine culture, blood culture, two sets of blood culture, definitely have to do for all kinds of patients. Uh, what patient was receiving before as a prophylaxis is important. For example, patients receiving quinolone prophylaxis before is an indication for vancomycin, and it, that's an indication not to give quinolone for the management of fibrinolone neutropenia. Any history of the documented infection, for example, the patient having history of the external spectrum with electromasis before, uh, you have to consider using imipenem for the next episodes of the fibrinotropenia, stuff like that. 
So two sets of blood cultures, that's the mandatory. And when I joined my hospital here in the year of National Guard, there was only one set of blood cultures. We have two sets of blood cultures. We don't have to wait for these results of culture. It can come in the next 48 hours. You have to start the empirical antibiotics and just over time when the culture comes back to you. If the patient does not have the central line, you can do the two peripheral uh, from the two different anatomic sides. And the other side specific cultures can be done according to the, uh, the symptom that the patient is reporting to the physician in the room. So uh, technically speaking, the every 10 years, uh, every decade that have been changed up and down, claim positive versus the claim negative. According to one of the study published in 2007, uh, it was an observational uh, or prospective study which involved more than 2,000 patients. Uh, around 20 to 25% of patients actually got reported uh, with the bacteremia. So it's in uh, rest of the around uh, 70, 75, 80% of patients were not reported so they still have to be treated until they are recovered. And uh, the most common incidence with the gram positive 57% versus 34% gram negative and 9% were fully microbial. Yet the mortality was more commonly seen with the gram negative one, 18% versus the 5%. And the Cedomonas aeruginosa is one of the most killing pathogens. So for that reason, all the empirical antibiotics that we use for the management of cobratropenia has to cover Pseudomonas uh, for um, these patients. So any, any antibiotic which covers the pseudomonas antibiotic can be used as a empirical antibiotic. But it should cover like broad spectrum, gram negative, gram positive. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So this was one of the studies that we did actually, one of my resident, uh, residency projects. So we did actually we looked at the compliance and also the epidemiology and the bacterial pattern of the bacterial episode that we have seen. So in 19% uh, of the episodes in Fabrantropenia that we have seen were associated with the uh, bacteremia. So here we have the commonly cultured organisms. So in gram negative, we can see E. coli, Klebsiella, typically E. coli, Klebsiella is the most common, but the deadly organism is the Pseudomonas aeruginosa that we have to target for this. Enterobacter is behaving also a resistant organism. Now we have E. coli and Klebsiella. Uh, behaving like resistant organisms like extended spectrum beta electromases or even um, uh, even KPCs or OXA48, you know, the multi drug resistant strain, which are even resistant to imipenem and meropenem. Then we have the citrobacterium, the acinitrobacterium and citrobacterium monas are more kind of like ICU originated bugs. And we rarely see them in uh, outside wards, but they, the patient goes to ICU. Our staff moving it back and forth, not having the hygienic practices, they can bring the acinitrobacterium and citrobacterium monas to the patients. <clears throat> From the gram positive bacteria, the most common organism we see the coagulase negative Staphylococcus aureus, which is generally uh, uh, false uh, positive bacteria. We say, like, this is false positive, but in case of febrile angiopenia, you have to always believe it and you have to always treat it. <clears throat> other, other organisms that we see is the bacteria, uh, like SEDEF um, uh, and fungi in AML, MDS, post transplant patients, we can see fungal infections. We don't see them most commonly in oncology, uh, medical oncology patients, but we see them more in hematology patients, aspergillosis, candidiasis, and even necrophagosis. So we have to treat it immediately, and uh, we have to start the antibiotics within the 60 minutes of arrivals in the hospitals. Uh, according to one of the studies, had shown that if you start within 60 minutes, you can reduce the mortality. So here is the fibrotropenia risk classification. So we classify them in high risk and low risk patients. So high risk patients are those patients who are actually uh, expected to have neutropenia uh, uh, less more than seven days, and profound neutropenia, which is less than 100 neutrophils, more than seven days, like typically AML, MDS patients. So these are high risk patients. So those patients who are clinically unstable patients are having significant comorbidities like hypertension, both present with sepsis. And those patients who are actually in the hospital at the time of the fever onset, they're high risk in comparison to those who are outside. Those who have abnormal uh, organ functions, is renal hepatic insufficiency, cardiac, these are also high risk patients. And those having grade three to four mycositis, they need also, they are also high risk because they need vancomycin and uh, they can have like bloodstream infection. And the uh, mass score of less than 21 is high risk and more than 21 is, is low risk. And the low risk patients are the opposite of the high risk patients. 
So for low risk patient, uh, you have two options uh, as per IDSN and CCN guidelines, preferred treatment. You can use ciprofloxacin uh, in combination with augmentin um, uh, or moxifloxacin. You can have a, an argument that moxifloxacin does not cover the coma as well. These are the low risk patients. And uh, for high risk patients, uh, you can, uh, this is the preferred regimen in IDSA guideline, A1 recommendation, cefepime 2 gram Q8 hours, imipenem 500 mg Q6 hours, minopenem 1 gram Q8 hours, or piperacin uh, tazobactam, tazosin 4.5 gram Q6 hours, and adults is the preferred regimen. Ceftazidine uh, can be used as well, in, uh, but that's, you know, does not cover the streptoridin, and it has the issues of the, uh, auto, uh, degradation of the, by the beta lactamase. So uh, I had been long thinking about a medication which can prevent this auto degradation of the ceftazidine. And now we have the ceftazidine vibrobactam, which is very powerful antibiotic, can be used to even treat the KPC of support and multi drug resistant strains of E. coli and capsilla. However, that's not approved for febrile entropenia. <clears throat> Some uh, institutions, you can use dual therapy. For example, if you have ESBL, like five center, we have like in, uh, incidence of ESBL ranging from 20, 25%. Non-ICU wars, what we use, we use telecin plus amicacin as a dual combination for two to three days. And if there is no documented infection, we can stop amicacin on day three, for instance. And if there is a documented infection, then we can just target the organism for the second duration. And uh, patients uh, with penicillin allergy with low risk, you can use Cipro uh, combination with Clinda or Estrinib in combination uh, with vancomycin for high risk patients. Uh, here in this slide, we have the indication when can we add vancomycin and brain positive um, coverage to the empiric therapy from the day one. So those patients who present with hemodynamic instability, with this hypertension, uh, radiographically documented pneumonia, those who have like positive blood culture, uh, uh, and those who have clinically suspected serious catheter-related infections, we can also add it from the day one. Those who have the skin and soft tissue infection, and those who have the colonization of MRSA, VR, et cetera, and those who have like great treated core mycositis. So these are the indication where you can actually throw your vancomycin and all the resources on day one. Oh, so how do you do the modification from the day one, day one to onward? So if there is MRSA, you add vancomycin or other antibiotic covering that. If there is VRD, you can add lenozolid or Mycin. If there's ESPL, you can add carbapenem. Right from the beginning, if there's KPC, you can add ceftazidine avibactam. If there's sedaf, you can add vancomycin oral. So here is the pathway. So for those patients who are high risk patients, so we just define them already. So we can start them on empirical antibiotics, the monotherapy or dual therapy based on the uh, institution specific antibiogram. Uh, we start them on IV antibiotics, and, uh, and then we adjust them according to uh, the organisms. If we have a specific organism that we can add, as we discussed before. So for high risk patient, if they have unexplained fever, and the the fever is persistent, but they are stable clinically, uh, no hypertension, etc., we don't need to change the antibiotic. But if the patient has fever B and culture negative, we continue antibiotics. Uh, until the neutrophil counts are more than 500. So this is a common question coming up again and again, like where's the duration of neutrophil, or the duration of the antibiotic for a patient, uh, those um, uh, who do not have the documented infection. So figure out an AML, those transplants. So we have to continue until the neutrophils are more than 500. For those patients who have documented infection, we have to target the certain duration, that organism for a certain duration. For example, if it is uh, like E. coli, so we typically give like 14 days of IV antibiotics in those kind of patients. If they are responding, so we just complete the duration. And if uh, not responding, then we have to do the CT chest scan, etc., uh, to rule out any other fungal infection, any collection, and then we adjust the antifungals as well. We talked about antifungal. Typically, uh, patient after four or five days uh, into febrile trypenia is a perfect host uh, for fungal infection because you know the best antifungal is the neutrophils. If the neutrophils are down, the profound neutropenia. So these patients are actually super high risk for developing fungal infection, particularly mold infection. So we have to give them um, antifungal, and uh, we can uh, do CT scan. And the CT scan shows some kind of pulmonary nodules. Or we do molecular markers, which is collectum. Menin. If the glactomenin is positive, or pulmonary nodules or hollow signs are positive, so then we can give preemptive moriconazole, which is the preferred regimen here. 
Okay, so empirical antifungal therapy um, in NCCN guideline IDSA guideline is fluconazole. I will give like usually casco function. And if we have, we can include like molecular markers or radiological uh, clue, then we give voriconazole as the first line of therapy. Also, you can give these patients fosaconazole or isaguconazole, which has much lesser interaction with other agents. Uh, switching gears, I think we had a little bit behind time, but uh, I think we'll try to finish it like uh, the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Uh, so audience response question number eight, a 45 year old may, woman is being uh, beginning her third cycle of adjuvant treatment of breast cancer at diagnosis her hemoglobin was 10. However, today it is less than 10. The patient has fatigue that is interfering with her activities of daily living, which is the most appropriate. We're not gonna come back again. So anemia and fatigue, uh, you know, Mainly patient, many patients with cancer, they have anemia uh, because of the cancer and because of the treatment of the cancer and fatigue is due to anemia because, you know, hemoglobin job is to transport oxygen to all the tissues and, you know, cells. So if the uh, hemoglobin is not yet there up to the mark, so the tissues are not going to be supplied with oxygen and nutrients, and that's why they start dying and that's, that explains the fatigue. So for that reason, we have to treat these kind of patients. One of the study done in the U.S., a uh, survey actually had shown like one of the most common bothersome complications or symptoms of cancer patient is fatigue. And most of the time, this fatigue is due to the anemia. If we can adjust the, uh, you know, anemia, we can treat the fatigue. So we can improve the quality of life with these kind of patients. So how can we do that? We can either give the blood transfusion or we can give anthropogenic stimulating agents. So when do we consider giving anthropogenic stimulating agents when hemoglobin is less than 10 and patient is symptomatic? And uh, uh, the quick way of uh, transfusing or correcting the hemoglobin is actually by giving the packed red blood cell transfusion. So one unit of the packed red blood cell increases hemoglobin by one gram per deciliter. Uh, the thing is that uh, uh, one of the study published like a long time ago, 2006 or seven, had shown that if you use uh, adixoportin stimulating agents in cancer patient, it is associated with shorter overall survival in comparison to if you don't use it. So NCCM guidelines since that time has recommended to use erythropoietin stimulating agents only in non-curable cancers. So uh, that we have to keep it in our mind. So this patient who is 45 year uh, old woman, third cycle of adjuvant treatment of breast cancer mean, adjuvant mean early stage breast cancer. So, this is curable. So in this case, you cannot use erythropoietin stimulating agent. What you have to do use is just the blood. So a patient is being treated in the curative setting and therefore is not eligible to receive an ESA. This is a very typically asked question in any VCPS exam. So uh, we talked about that. Now moving, switching gauge to dextrazoxane. So dextrazoxane is one of the chi waving agents. So it was one of the, um, you know, iron chelating agent. Uh, so you know what uh, enterocycline does, like doxorubicin, donorubicin, adorubicin, they produce three radicals. And these three radicals uh, are cytotoxic and these are uh, inactivated by superoxide dismutase in our body, except the heart where the superoxide dismutase is not enough. So for that reason, those patients who have received more than 300 milligrams per square of uh, doxorubicin or equi its equivalent, they are still responding. So these are the patients who actually will need uh, dextrazoxane as per FDA and CCN guidelines. Uh, it can prevent uh, the cardiac toxicity by prevention of the, by, by binding with the doxorubicin or doxorubicin produced free radicals damage is prevented in the heart. So, that's the answer. The patient has reached the appropriate cumulative dose of doxorubicin to consider dexazoxane because the patient has received six cycles of 50 milligram per meter square. So 200 milligrams per meter square has already been reached by using the DVDs. So now the patient wants to use, continue the intracycline. You have to consider dexazoxane in this patient. Okay, so mesna is another protective agent. So mercoplecaptoethane sulfonate sodium. So whenever we use iphosomide, particularly in cyclophosomide, it produces acrolein. And acrolein binds with the wall of the bladder and can cause hemorrhagic cystitis. So mesna uh, uh, not only prevents the binding of the acrolein with the wall of the bladder, but also uh, binds with it, makes it like neutral. So it produces the, the incidence of hemorrhagic cystitis. So this is the guideline that we have when we use iphosomide, uh, the form of the bolus. We use 60% of the dose of the 
I fossa night, so 20% of the time, zero, then four hours and 18 hours. And uh, you have to keep it in mind that it's bioavailability is 50%. So if you give oral dose, so oral dose has to be doubled. And if you're giving with uh, continuous NPNF, I fossa night, you have to give 20% of the time, zero, and 40% along with it. If you're giving it with high dose, I fossa night, this is the guideline written for Ministry of National Guard of Affairs by me and by my team. So in that case, you give 20% of the time, zero, and nearly 100% along with it. So you get more than 100 to 160% in case of high dose plasma, particularly when you use like more than 2.5 grams for the for example, in rice or ice pork foods. So audience response question number 10, which one of the following is the correct sequence for administering plasma and iphosomide? So answer is here. So you can be tested here. So I'm just because of positive times, so I'd like to go over quickly. Time zero, four and eight hours. The last is the tumor lysis syndrome, uh, prevention and management. This is another medical uh, oncology emergency. So what happens when you give chemotherapy, it breaks down the chemotherapy cell and that uh, results in leakage of the cytoplasmic content of potassium, phosphorus, and uric acid from the breakdown of the nucleic acids that results in hyperuricemia um, that can cause uh, renal failure, um, Hyperkalemia can cause cardiac arrest, and hyperphosphatemia can cause hypocalcemia, tatany, arrhythmia, etc. In general, chemo, uh, the tumor lysis syndrome is really a medical emergency. If you don't treat it, patient can have multi uh, organ failure, uh, significant morbidity, and mortality. And I always ask this question to medical oncology, hematology fellows, physician, clinical pharmacists, residents. They always fail in my exam. Is tumulysis good or not? So when I explain all the scenario complications of tumulysis, always they say tumulysis is bad. Tumulysis is not bad because our purpose of the chemotherapy that we use in, in our patient is to break down the tumor cells. But tumulysis is good, but tumulysis syndrome is not good. So as a pharmacist, so as an oncology pharmacist, it's our job, it's our responsibility to act before the chemolysis happens. Sometimes patient comes with spontaneous chemolysis even before the start of the chemotherapy because of the involvement and engagement of our immune system. And in our hospital, it is me and my team who actually wrote down the guidelines for the chemolysis syndrome prevention and management. And not only this, we also published papers on chemolysis syndrome prevention and management. So this risk uh, stratification is by ASCO, American Society of Clinical Oncology, which uh, segregates patients into high, intermediate, and low risk. So generally, Burkitt lymphoma is very high risk, and ALL patient, AML patient with WBC count more than 100,000 is very high, and any other cancer patient, including lymphoma patient with, uh, WB, uh, with the lymph node size more than 10 centimeter, is considered high risk. For hyperuricemia, you have to give olipidinol or respiratory case and IV fluids, of course. Hyperkalemia has to be managed as you do any other uh, hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, likewise, any other hyperphosphatemia with the oral phosphate binder that you have to give it with food. And hypocalcemia, we try to restrict it unless patient is uh, symptomatic. We don't try to replace it and we give it very carefully and, and you know, because the risk of uh, calcium phosphorus uh, precipitation, if we give a lot of calcium, and phosphorus is already high and the calcium phosphorus precipitation can result in multi-organ failure. So you give like one gram calcium gluconate to the patient is symptomatic, uh, like for example, patient having tatany and stuff like that, or the calcium is less than 1.75 millimole per liter. Uh, for uh, a low, I'm not gonna talk about that. For intermediate, you have to develop the non and hydration and you repeat uh, tumulysis syndrome at least uh, once daily or twice daily. Uh, and for high risk, you have to give very good aggressive hydration and you give them respiratory care. The lipid not is not going to work alone. And what we do, the respiratory care six milligram single fixed dose strategy that is as effective as multiple daily dosing. And at any time, the tumulysis syndrome happens, whether it's low, intermediate, or high risk. So the management is the same. You give respiratory case and you treat all the electrolyte imbalance. With regards to the high risk, you have to monitor them at least two, eight hours. And we give uh, tumor lysis prevention prophylaxis for seven days, at least five to seven days. So here is the differences between allopurinol and the respiratory case. Allopurinol, it inhibits this antioxidase, where the respiratory case work on the preformed uric acid and convert it to allantoin. You know, uric acid is not soluble in the urine. So that's why people have been giving alkalinization, which is not recommended because it can promote the calcium phosphorus precipitation. With regards to the respiratory case, allantoin is soluble in the acidic urine, so that's fine. 
but you have to do glucose six phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. Yeah, you can recall like three, four patients in my clinical experience where the patient had hemoglobin 13, 14, 15, dropped down to three to four, four to five gram per deciliter because of the G6 phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. They have auto, uh, hemolytic anemia. <coughs> <coughs> Allopinol is cheap, but respiratory case is very expensive. There are some uh, uh, drug drug interaction with regards to the allopinol. Uh, when you use, like for example, 6 MP, 6 TG, so you should not be using allopinol along with it. So you can probably use respiratory case. If you have to, then you, have, you can reduce the dose of the 6 MP and 6 TG. So audience response question number 11, you guess it is high, serum peritone is high, testing is high, phosphorus is high. So this is laboratory tremolysis syndrome as per Cairo Bishop definition. And also the patient has laboratory uh, clinical tremolysis syndrome because the creatinine is high. So what is the um, recommended treatment here? Aggressive hydration and respiratory case. This was a paper that we published in the American Journal of Hematology and Ecology like a couple of years ago using six milligram single fixed dose strategy. And we found out this strategy is as effective as multiple daily dosing. And these were the number of patients that are 95 patients, the most common uh, diseases uh, were actually acute leukemia and, lymph and lymphoma, and percal lymphoma. The primary endpoint was uh, uh, normalization of uric acid at uh, 24 and 48 hours using six milligram fixed dose. We found out 80% of patients they had normalization of uric acid at, um, at uh, time 24 and 48 hours. And at 96 hours, 90% of the patients had normalization of uric acid, 70% of them had normalization of creatinine, and only 80% of the patients had required single, uh, single dose. Then around 20% uh, of patients that required the uh, second dose, so we try to look at the correlation between the acute renal dysfunction and presentation and requirement of the additional dose, we found about 50% of patients, those who uh, required the second dose actually had some kind of renal dysfunction at presentation. And uh, with regards to the appropriateness of the additional dose of the respiratory case, when we uh, use this criteria that we should not be repeating the dose of the respiratory case until the uric acid is uh, more than the upper normal limit, which is one in 20 microgram, micromole per liter, or more than seven milligram per deciliter, using this definition of, for the appropriateness, only one third of patients who received the second dose were appropriately indicated. And uh, with this uh, strategy, we had significant cost saving benefit of 1.2 million real using the direct cost comparison. And with, the, uh, with that, I would like to say you thank you. Now the floor is uh, to all of you for any questions. Uh, I think I finished it in time. It took like two, five minutes extra. Thank you, Dr. Mansoor, for such an informative uh, lecture. Uh, I would like to ask uh, participants to uh, ask your queries, if you have any to Dr. Mansoor right now. Anybody? Yes, please. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Mansoor. Thank you for the most, you know, comprehensive lecture. Sir, I have one question. I was not aware of the other drug uh, besides allopurinol. Uh, or this, uh, I guess. And what was this? Uh, Sir, what was its uh, pharmacological classification, and what class? Uh, it, is, it is. Uh, it, it is uric oxidase. Uric oxidase. So this is an enzyme which is not found in the human being. This is this is an enzyme which is found in mammalian uh, in actually birds actually. So we collect it from the we collect it from the birds. So what it does basically, for example, if the patient presents with uh, spontaneous tumorlysis syndrome. Like for example, patient has Burkitt lymphoma and the, uh, the immune system was there intact. T cell starts breaking down the cell. So uh, patient presents with like sky high uric acid, laboratory tumor lysis, clinical tumor lysis, renal failure. So you need to you need to choose something which work on preformed uric acid. Elopinol is not going to help you in this uh, point in time. Uh, the respiratory case is going to work on the uric acid and we convert. The, uh, the uric acid to alantoin. So believe me, now I'm doing a study on three milligram and I found about 90 patients, three milligram is as effective as six milligram, which is as effective as seven days, 0.2 milligram per kg. So this drug, even if you use one vial, which is 1.5 milligram, or two vials, which is three milligram, it is going to convert all the available uric acid in the blood 
to elantoin, which is easily soluble in urine and it is easily excretable from the urine if you give aggressive hydration. So you have to give very good hydration as well in order to uh, promote uh, excretion of the elantoin from the body. Okay, so we have to properly hydrate the patient as well. Actually, the hydration is the mainstay of the treatment for the thrombolysis syndrome prevention and the management, and uh, anything else would add its value. And respiratory case, for sure, for the management of the laboratory and clinical thrombolysis syndrome, this is uh, the top of the list that you should have in your institution for the management of those kind of patients. And we are giving it an IV formulation, sir? IV form yes. or oral yes. form? No, there's no oral. This IV. There's no oral Thank you so much, sir. So do we have more questions? So as uh, there are no more questions, uh, thank you so much uh, once again, Dr. Mansoor, for your time. And uh, uh, GBBD team uh, always highly appreciate your uh, contribution towards our uh, BCPS preparatory classes cohort two program. So uh, that's all for today. Now we have uh, our next session on uh, coming Tuesday on 15th of March that will be regarding men's and women's health. And it will be presented to you by Dr. Aisha Tavinda. Uh, till then, thank you everyone for being with us in today's session. Uh, take care and we are signing out from this meeting Thanks. now. Thank you. Thank, 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 thank you a lot, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. 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 Okay.